Thank you, sir. And now, having waited with bated breath, I will hand over the podium to our chief guest who will present his address. I now invite our esteemed chief guest, Professor C. N. R. Rao, to deliver his guest lecture aptly titled The Celebration of Science. I am sure that the younger audience will be enthralled to listen to such an eminent orator and scientist and be truly inspired by his example. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be here. I have heard of the reputation of Shankar Netralia for years and the wonderful work done by this great institution, particularly by Dr. Badrina. I am uh, thankful for their invitation. I must also thank Dr. Professor Madhavan, Dr. Baskaran, Dr. George, Dr. Krishna Kumar, and others who have taken immense trouble uh, in arranging this function. Institutions like this can only survive if the citizens of India contribute to it. The government can only contribute so much, and in fact, government contribution alone cannot help India to become a great country. Only the countries become great when the ordinary citizens start contributing to institutions. That is the story of America. For Israel, everything is contributed by citizens. And India, private contribution is very negligible compared to government contribution. Even today, Indian science and technology, 85% of Indian science is still government only hardly 15% from private sector. So we are hoping in about 25 years or 10 years, I don't know when, 50% will be private sector, 50% will be government. And we are waiting for it for a long time. Well, I'm very glad to see that donations are being made to this uh, wonderful institution by citizens of Chennai and elsewhere. I'm delighted. Uh, today, I, when I had to give a talk, decide a talk, I had many choices. In fact, I could have given a talk on my research and nanotechnology and many other things, but I decided not to do that, but talk about science itself. Because science is not appreciated by everybody properly. In fact, by most people. For many, even scientists do not completely understand why they are doing science. Science is not there because of government money. Science is not there because somebody is pushing grants. Science is there because of the inner urge of man, the creative urge of man, which has nothing to do with government, nothing to do with grants. Imagine Michael Faraday did the greatest of science that anyone can do in one li one's life when there were no government grants. The greatest of science that was done by Galileo or Newton had no government grants. So real science, therefore, done by real scientists has nothing to do with these extraneous parameters such as government, agencies, funding. Man, as long as his intellect will continue to work on new ideas, create new, not only create new ideas and innovations, but also contribute to the well-being of mankind through his scientific effort. Having said that, I thought because of this, this I should say something about science. The reason I am saying this is, it is a wonderful opportunity for you. 2011, was the centenary of the discovery of the atom. Just one year ago. Many people don't have not realized that. You know, for those who may not remember, 2008 and 2009, we celebrated the bicentenary of Charles Darwin and the 150th anniversary of the first great scientist of India, named Jesse Bose. Jesse Bose missed the Nobel Prize, unfortunately, which he should have got for the work he did on the passage of microwaves through matter, etc. And we celebrated his life, 150 years, 50th anniversary, and also Charles Darwin Bicentenary in 2008 and 2009. But 2011, unfortunately, everybody got absorbed in uh, other things. They said it was the International Year of Chemistry. I'll come back to that. But the biggest thing about 2011 was it was exactly 100 years ago the structure of the atom was proposed by Lord Rutherford. And what is interesting is this is a picture of Lord Rutherford sitting in the, standing in the center with Cockcroft and Walton on either side. Cockcroft and Walton are the ones who built the first Landigraph machine. And this is the man who proposed the idea of an atom, the structure of an atom in 1911. And of course, I don't, you don't have to read it. The reason I'm showing this is, even though the Rutherford atom is slightly wrong, it is not completely correct. But that is the atom. When we think of an atom, atomic structure, we always think of Rutherford atom. 
even today. And this happened exactly 100 years ago. So I thought we should know that. That is why I called this lecture celebration of science. Many things like that we ignore. Another important thing, this is by the way the picture of uh, uh, Rutherford who got a Nobel Prize in 1908. This is a very interesting story. For those who may not know, in 1895, he wanted to do a PhD in Cambridge University. And uh, he wanted to study there, but there was a rule in Cambridge at that time that no one who did not have a graduate degree, graduation from that university, could do research there. You had to be a graduate of Cambridge to do PhD there. For the first time, they removed that restriction in 1895. The first student admitted by Cambridge was Rutherford. So if that did happen that year, Rutherford would never have gone to uh, Cambridge, you see. And when he went there, J.J. Thompson, was the professor of physics, was just then about to discover the electron. I hope you all know, you should not only know science, you must know how science was created, how ideas were created in science. It is very important to know the history of science, therefore, and the people who made it possible. J.J. Thompson, 1897, was the discovery of the electron. Here is the young man, Rutherford. He goes there, and just then the electron is being discovered. That was the atmosphere. You know, 1895 to 1908 is exactly 11 years. He gets a Nobel Prize. Rutherford got a Nobel Prize in 1908, just 11 years after he entered Cambridge University for having worked on the disintegration very much. He was a very great man. And three years later, he came with the structure of the atom. Now, 1911, 100 years ago, another major discovery took place. Again, people didn't celebrate it anywhere in the world. I want to tell you, Camerling owns, in 2011, discovered superconductivity. Superconductivity as a phenomenon was not known till 1911. It was Camerling Owens in Amsterdam who discovered that. And this is the picture of Camerling Owens who discovered superconductivity. And I'm showing this picture where Camerling Owens is standing, uh, he's, sitting, he's with uh, his guru, Van der Waals. I hope you all know Van der Waals, or Van der Waals interaction. And this is picture. And he was the one, Camerling Owens, the first one who liquefied helium and also discovered superconductivity. And this is, this is the first plot of Oh, a material becoming superconducting. Mercury became superconducting at 4.3 Kelvin, and this was the first plot of superconducting transition made by him in 1911, and we celebrated the 100th anniversary just last year. And 1911, a very major thing happened, which I know most of you do not know. If you do not know, as a scientist, it's a disgrace. If you are not a scientist, I will excuse you. The history of science one of the most important happenings in the history of science is what is known as the first Solvay Conference in 1911. All the great minds of the world at that time in science were brought together in Belgium to discuss science, 1911, in Belgium. And this is the photograph of that occasion. I hope you can see here, in the center, somewhere here, you can see Madame Curie sitting there, and uh, behind her, you see Rutherford is standing there, in the corner to the right, you can see Einstein standing there. I hope you can see Einstein, young Einstein. You see, Einstein is standing there because Einstein was still not important at that time. You see, Einstein was not yet known. In, what is the known? I will take care of myself. Uh, uh, I, 19, uh, what I was about to say. Einstein was not known in 1911. So you see, he had to stand there. So, in you know, a great mind, that decided what kind of physical world we are dealing with, the so-called quantum mechanical world, came about in 1911 after the famous Solvay conference. And in fact, this is the second picture, the fifth Solvay conference. The reason I'm showing this is, by that time, I, this was in 1927, Einstein had become very famous because of relativity, he is now sitting in the center. <laughs> is Einstein, you see, now, is sitting in the center, and there you see the great Niels Bohr was sitting there, and behind him is a young man called Heisenberg. I hope these young people should know the story of Heisenberg. Heisenberg, at the age of 20 or so, he had no job. He writes to Niels Bohr, the great man, he's also a famous man. Niels Bohr considered Rutherford as his teacher, so he always called Rutherford as his teacher. Anyway, Heisenberg gets a job as a research assistant, like many of you here. A research fellow under Niels Bohr. And once Niels Bohr takes a holiday for three weeks, 
in summer. When he goes there, Heisenberg does a very interesting piece of work. When he comes back, Niels Bohr from the holiday, Heisenberg, he's a young boy of 22. Imagine a research scholar here telling one of the professors here, Sir, Professor Bohr, when you are away, I made this major discovery. He tells him, I've discovered the principle of uncertainty. And you have? Then show me where you have done. No, no, no. I've already sent it to a journal for publication. I mean, you know, he, the Niels Bohr tells him, you know, young Heisenberg, couldn't you have waited for three weeks after my holiday? Would I come? No, no, no. It is too important for, to wait for anybody. So, of course, Heisenberg got a Nobel Prize for this discovery later. And that is the kind of men we are dealing with today. See, when we celebrate science, we must think of all these wonderful names. Heisenberg, at the age of 23, made this great contribution and the uncertainty principle, which, of course, changed the nature of quantum mechanics. And, of course, he got a Nobel Prize much later. But I'm trying to remind you, the kind of people in this photograph of Salve Conference. I'm show, again showing this picture of the 1911 Salve Conference because last uh, there was a celebration of the 100th anniversary of the first Salve Conference, 2011. I was fortunate to be invited to be one of the speakers, though I'm not a physicist, but I know they were kind enough to invite. So I just I'm showing you again the picture, the first Salve Conference picture, the 100th anniversary picture. 2011 was also a centenary of Madame Curie's second Nobel Prize. Madame Curie got the first Nobel Prize in 1903 for physics. I hope you all know that. And the second Nobel Prize was in 1911. She got a Nobel Prize in recognition of the work she did in discovering elements, radium and polonium. Of course, even though there are a lot of young ladies here, so I've intentionally put this to remind you young women Women always had a very rough time in science. Even today, I think they have a difficult time. Women don't get enough opportunities. I'm very unhappy about that. Uh, they get the opportunity to get a PhD, but after that, they have difficulty. So then it was very difficult. Here is a woman with two Nobel Prizes. And, you know, against her, there were so many write-ups in newspapers in France that with two Nobel Prizes, Madame Curie was never made a member of the French Academy. You know, I've been a member of the French Academy for many years. I'm really amazed how this academy didn't elect a great woman like Madame Curie with two Nobel Prizes as a member of that academy. So she had to suffer a lot. I'm just trying to remind you the story. In the story of science, some bitter things are also, also there. This year, 2012, what is the biggest, bigger thing that happened one year later? In 1912, another young boy of 22, walking around the backs in Cambridge, near the Cam, Cam River, suddenly got a bright idea of X-ray crystallography. The first paper on X-ray crystallography was written in 1912 by Lawrence Bragg. Lawrence Bragg, you, in fact, I've read that paper many, many times. It's still on my table. It's amazing how this young boy wrote that paper in 1912 on the structure of zinc sulfide. I'll never, beautiful. How did he analyze that crystal structure? What is so great about that, you may say? If that discovery had not been made, this institute wouldn't be here. All the progress in biology and chemistry is mainly because of crystallography. If crystal structure of proteins were, couldn't have been solved, nucleic acids couldn't have been solved, you couldn't have studied the structures of mole molecules, drugs, all kinds of things, science would have been way behind, several centuries behind. It is that first paper that is, this, that is therefore very seminal, very important to remember. And he got a Nobel Prize for it a few years later. A few years later, he and his father shared the Nobel Prize for X-ray diffraction. Actually, his father didn't contribute much. It mainly this young boy at that time. But anyway, they shared a Nobel Prize. Well, like many of them, even today, make a mistake. There is a very famous called Bragg equation. You all know that. N lambda, N lambda equal to 2D sine theta. Every, that is due to this boy, Lawrence Bragg, young boy, 22 years. So I want to know the young people here, so you don't have to be an old man like me to get a Nobel Prize. Of course, not that I'm going to get it either. So don't tell you. Young people have got brilliant ideas to get a Nobel Prize. 22 years. All of them are 22, 23. Anyway, coming back. 2011 was the International Year of Chemistry. I hope you all know that. And I don't know whether you celebrated here. I'm trying to remind you. 100 years of the second Nobel Prize of Madame Curie was celebrated as the International Year of Chemistry. 
and just to remind you what happened, 1911, you know, we didn't know, the X-rays had just been discovered, radioactivity had just been discovered, noble gases had just been discovered. See, chemical bond, the idea of a chemical bond was not known in 1911. The idea of a chemical bond came only in 1916 with the first paper on chemical bond. So, today, 2011, of course, we have made much progress after that. What is important to know is, even though we say 1911 not much was known, in the early 20th century and late 19th century, people like Mendeleev and many others had uh, contributed, Faraday had contributed to science even in the 19th century. I want you to remember that. So let me remind you how chemistry itself started. I hope you all know the father of chemistry is considered to be Lavoisier, who died in the year 1794. And he's considered to be father of chemistry because he is the one who enunciated the idea of a conservation of mass, very important principle in science. He is the one who said that there was something called a finite composition for every compound. He was the one who said air is oxygen and nitrogen. He is considered to be the father of chemistry. And of course, he died in 1794. He didn't die actually, he was guillotined. There was a French revolution. His head, you know, was put under a guillotine machine, was chopped off because he was very close to the king and queen of France when the French Revolution was there. One of the heads that went off was this head, very brilliant head in chemistry, cut off in 1794. I hope you all know history of India. 1794, what happened? You know that in India? Just three years later, Tipu Sultan was fighting the British near Mysore. And he almost got into the British. If only he had kicked out the British in the third war of Mysore, British wouldn't have been in India. Anyway, that was around the same time, 1794, 1790. French Revolution, Tipu Sultan, they're all roughly of the same period. Okay. I don't want to talk much about it, just to remind you, exactly 1803, rough 200 years ago, Dalton gave the idea of an atom. But then came, in the 18th century, the famous Michael Faraday. Everybody who is in science, and everybody who is a human being, must know the story of Faraday. If any of you don't know, I'll keep quiet. I'm amazed that you don't know if you are a scientist because there's no scientist who can ever beat his record. I think he's the greatest scientist this Mother Earth has produced. We have not, I will not see a better example again I think in science. You know, he was there only three years of schooling. He was an assistant to a bookbinder, don't forget. One day he was, had book, he had bound a book on electricity, something to do with Voltas, Voltas book, Voltas lectures. Then somebody enters the bookbinder's shop and the bookbinder tells this man, Sir, he is binding the book on electricity. This young boy, Faraday, is very much interested in science. And this man who visited the bookbinder says, Oh, is that so? You know what? There, is a, there are lectures by Sir Humphrey Davy on chemistry, three lectures, for which I have tickets. Maybe this boy wants to go and give him the tickets. So this man who came to the bookbinder shop gave the tickets to Faraday to attend the lectures of Humphrey Davy. Humphrey Davy then was a very famous scientist, uh, giving wonderful lectures to all kinds of people, kings and queens, everybody used to attend his lectures. So um, Michael Faraday goes and attends his lectures. That, that changed Michael Faraday. He was a young boy, only three years of schooling. He writes down everything that Mike, Humphrey Davy said in his lecture. And then bind, when he comes back, he binds that as a book, goes back to Humphrey Davy, Sir, your three lectures are bound as a book, three lectures by Davy, and please take my, uh, this bound book of your lectures. Oh, Davy said, wonderful. You know, he's just the young boy has come. And then before going, he says, do you think you can give me a job? As usual, many people must be coming to you also. And usually senior people, oh, there are no vacancies, I'm sorry, you know, they would send you away. He said, there's no job here anyway. And amazingly, one month later, there is a fellow who is working in the lab who runs away from Davy's lab. And Sir Humphrey Davy said, you know, I remember that boy, Faraday. Maybe I should get him. He calls him and gives him a job. Do you know what his first job, Faraday's job in Davy's lab was? His title, Chief Bottle Washer. That was his title. He was made the Chief Bottle Washer in Davy's lab. And he was washing bottles, cleaning, slowly trying to help Davy in his experiment then learning to do his own experiments. So in the year 1816, he wrote his first paper by himself, the first paper of his. 
He wrote his own paper. Then he started doing his own experiment. It was a very, very clever experiment. It became better and better. Later, he becomes an independent research worker. After Devi, he even becomes a professor with only three years of schooling. And what is interesting is the number of things he did. Everyone knows lots of electrolysis. He was the first one to, the first to liquefy gases like chlorine. He did experiments on catalysis. Uh, discovery of benzene. Benzene was discovered by him. He was the one who did magnetism, you know. Paramagnetism, diamagnetism, all these words. He is the one who called coined those words. I hope you know, he is the one who coined the word electrode, anode, cathode, ion. All these words we use every day were all words of Faraday. In fact, when he gave those words, people didn't like those words. But anyway, now we accept that they are all Faraday's words. Diamagnetism, paramagnetism. In fact, well, you know, as a teacher, I must, if you don't mind, I have to walk a bit. Uh, as a teacher, I must tell you, even today I'm impressed. You know, he had to determine property of oxygen and nitrogen. Oxygen is paramagnetic. I hope you know that. You know that? Or I hope you know. School will teach that. And nitrogen is not paramagnetic. He is the one who did that. How do you think he did it? Even today it amazes me his experiment. What he does is, he makes soap bubbles containing oxygen and soap bubbles containing nitrogen. He passes these bubbles through a magnet. And the bubbles containing oxygen stuck to the magnet. Bubbles too containing nitrogen didn't stick to the magnet. So immediately he concluded oxygen is paramagnetic. Do that experiment today. Not easy. How did he do that experiment? You know the kind of experiments. Oh, there is one experiment called Faraday rotation. I'm telling you there are some very good experiments. Like Pradeep is a very good experiment. List. But I, he, he will not be able to set up Faraday rotation. One month I will give him. He won't be able to set up. Very difficult. A very really difficult experiment even today. He did the Faraday rotation. How the plane of polarization of light changes on applying magnetic field in certain materials. By God, he did an extraordinary experiment. In fact, rather, Lord Rutherford said, if only Faraday were alive in 20th century, he would have got at least six Nobel Prizes. That's what Faraday, Rutherford said. I have counted, I think he would have got five. Four to five, definitely, in one lifetime. Unfortunately, it was in 19th century when there were no Nobel Prizes. So that is Faraday. There are many young people I want you to know something else about human qualities of scientists. Faraday, when he did all this, the queen, give, one day he gets the letters from the key queen, Mr. Faraday, we want to make, we have decided to give you a knighthood. So we could, then he would have become Sir Michael Faraday. Then he writes back to the queen, my dear queen, thank you so much for this honor you are doing me by making me a knight of the empire. But, you know, I'm, everyone calls me Michael, Michael, Michael Faraday. I don't want your knighthood. He doesn't accept it. Show me another Indian, another scientist who does that. I'm an extraordinary. He was a scientist, real scientist. Nothing to do with honors to this world. The honors of a different kind. And in fact, he was invited by the Royal Society to become a president. Then he writes back, thank you so much for asking me to the president of the Royal Society. It is a great honor. But you know, my place is in the laboratory. Thank you so much. He didn't accept it. Today, you know, if you give five rupees, most people run and take the job. That is the thing. Great men, great scientists don't come from such people. Now, Faraday, I'm telling you because history of science and history of chemistry, he was a chemist. He discovered electricity. I hope you know that the last one, electricity by induction. When he discovered electricity, the finance minister, the famous story, the chancellor of the exchequer went and asked Faraday, Mr. Faraday, what is the use of this discovery of electricity? He said, sir, one day you will tax it, he said. And sure enough, we are paying that. Okay. And quickly, then there was a famous net crazy Russian called Mendeleev. Very great man. You see, this is a matter of luck. Mendeleev died in 1907. Mendeleev is the one who gave the idea of a periodic table. But he died in 1907. He should have been given a Nobel Prize, you see. 1906, unfortunately, he, would have, he could have got the French, he got a, a Frenchman called Moisan, got a Nobel Prize for discovering fluorine. Poor Russian didn't get it. You know, Russians and Indians don't get the recognition so easily. Uh, Indians, also, the Indians, Russian come in the bottom of the uh, value system in generally in the world. But I just want to tell you about the story of chemistry. In the first century, you know, people say, oh, in India, we knew all of chemistry even 5,000 years ago. 
it is nice to be proud. I am also very proud to be an Indian. I wanted to know that. But we didn't know enough chemistry. We knew just adding colors and making something. That doesn't mean we knew what was happening. The first century, we only knew seven elements. 16th century, we knew 10 elements. 18th century, we knew actually 23. I should be, when that was the year 23 elements were known. 20th century, 114 elements, you know. So you can see chemistry is really a modern subject. I include the picture of my great teacher, Glenn Seaborg. Because they, he is the one who made a lot of artificial elements, including plutonium. I hope you know what plutonium means. If you don't know, since you are in Madras, you better know what plutonium is. You have a Kalpakam reactor here. This is the periodic table. Uh, last year, I gave a major lecture in Sweden, uh, where I this in fact I've taken it from my lecture. I, there I said the great, the greatest man-made table. I said, I don't think any table made by man has more information and more substance than this table, the periodic table. I'm not going to give a lecture on it, and some other day maybe, not today. I just am showing you that. Man, chemists have made lots of molecules. It started with the smallest molecule, the first molecule made in chemistry, urea. Now, since then, lots of molecules have been made. This is the first molecule made by Wohler. Then, Lots of molecules made by many scientists, including Woodward and a number of other scientists. Suppose you ask me, when did chemistry start? Well, I would say the real state chemistry of today, modern chemistry started, when the, we understood that when we put two electrons between two atoms in the chemical bond, and this idea came by G. L. Lewis in 1916, and then came, this was expounded by Linus Pauling, much later. This is the picture of G. L. Lewis. G. L. Lewis, I always show this picture because everyone knows, if you want to know human stories, real stories of science, in chemistry and in science in general, one should know the story of G. L. Lewis. He produced more scientists, more chemists than any other person I know in the history of chemistry. Almost every student of his got a Nobel Prize. But G. L. Lewis didn't get a Nobel Prize. Why? I don't know. It's a miracle even now. A thing which I cannot understand. How a man like G. L. Lewis was never given a Nobel Prize. I consider him to be the greatest chemist of the 20th century. Linus Pauling, I would put him below him, after Lewis. But Linus Pauling got two Nobel Prizes. This is Linus Pauling, young man, just married. Then he started working on the chemical bond. Linus Pauling and his wife. What did Lewis do? I just want to show you. He was only... The story of Lewis is long. I will not talk about it today. Even when he was a young student in Harvard University, when he was about 21, 22, the electron had just been discovered. And so immediately he wrote a paper called The Electron and the Molecules. Unfortunately, when he wrote that, people, his professor said, oh, it's all foolish. He didn't uh, encourage it. So he couldn't publish it even. So much later, it was one of the first one, therefore, to come with the idea of a chemical bond. He was the first one to talk about thermodynamics in chemistry. One well, of the earliest person, I hope you all know, Louis Acid, the Louis Basis, he's the one who came with that. In fact, when he was nominated with the Nobel Prize about 20, 15 times for the idea of chemical bond, every time the Nobel Committee said, well, chemical bond, we don't know if it's going to be important or not in chemistry. But today, people will laugh at it. Much later, in 1954, Linus Pauling got Nobel Prize for Linus Chemical Bond. But he never got it. He died in 1946. But anyway, when he made Lewis acid, the idea of Lewis acid and Lewis basis, in fact, the PhD thesis of Glenn Seaborg under him, and people said, Lewis acid, we don't know, the Nobel Prize Committee said, whether it will ever be accepted as an important thing in chemistry. He, he never got, therefore, anything that, uh, 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 recognition of the kind he deserved. Heavy water is very interesting, the story of, you know, deuterium, I hope you all know that, deuterium was discovered by a student of Lewis called Harold Urey. And uh, as soon as it was discovered, Lewis said, you know, what is the use of an atom of deuterium? I want to make a compound. So heavy water was made in Berkeley uh, using the electrochemical cells there, the, the water in the left over there. And he made heavy water and studied properties, all kinds of things, published many papers, but eventually when the Nobel Prize was given, it was only given for discovery of deuterium, but not heavy water. So it's one of those very interesting stories of chemistry of a great chemist being denied a uh, Nobel Prize for some reason. Okay, chemistry after the chemical bond and so on became very dominated by structure, molecules, 
I will not be talking about that since you are dealing in this laboratory or this uh, institution with a lot of proteins and uh, biomedical uh, bio research and practice of uh, various kinds in medicine, you have to know molecules. Uh, today I am afraid uh, without molecules uh, your research in bi biology or uh, uh, medicine will not worth anything, it will be all molecule based. So uh, you need mass spectrometer because again molecules are there. So molecules have to be understood. And this is the first structure of a protein. Then all these molecules in 1951, I was doing my PhD, I'm sorry, I was doing my MSE and I suddenly found protein structure I had discovered. In fact, Linus Pauling, this I'm showing you because Linus Pauling, when he discovered it, he didn't really understand the, what importance it was. In fact, I wrote to Linus Pauling from India, you know, I want to work with you. Do it. I didn't know what protein was, but nothing was known. I, then he wrote something else to me saying that you work with a student of mine and uh, uh, anyway, I, I worked with his student later, but Linus Pauling was the first one to solve, a chemist to solve the structure of an alpha helix. I believe that started the birth of molecular biology. And then, of course, I hope you know the double helix came. This is a single helix. Double helix came in the DNA, just 52, 53. I hope you all know being in Chennai, 1954, 53, the triple helix came from Madras, G. N. Ramchandran in colleges. Single helix, double helix, triple helix, 1951 to 54. Three years, three helices. But we and Ramchandran got nothing. Uh, this was a very a sad story. Since you're all from Chennai, let me tell you. When we did this double helix, triple helix of collagen in 1954, I was, I, I was just in America at that time. I just gone to do my PhD. I was amazed. It was a very nice piece of work. It was in nature. Within two, three, four years, he should have got international recognition for that. At least he should have become a fellow of the Royal Society or something. But somehow it didn't happen. And he became an FRS in the year 1976. So, you know, 54 to 76, how many years you see? 22 years after the Triple Helix. It is the most insulting thing that they did. Anyone, all the, you can internet. Even nationally, we in India didn't honor him enough at that time. I really feel was one of those who was uh, not sufficiently honored when it was necessary. Of course, then later, I don't want to talk about his life. That is not the important thing. I feel he was one of those very, very fantastic scientists, but not sufficiently honored either in India or in the world at the right time. And uh, unfortunately, it's so. And, and this is the story of the helices I thought I would mention. And this is how Linus Pauling looked when he discovered the alpha helix. In fact, uh, a year later, he came to India. He was supposed to come to India, but it actually didn't come. Okay. Chemistry then became a very important thing, full of structure, synthesis, dynamics. And it was only later, in 1970s and 80s, chemistry and molecular biology started combining a lot. So you people are interested in it. If you don't know enough chemistry, you will not do good biology, please. Uh, you will do poor biology. If you want to be a good biologist, you must know good chemistry. There is no doubt in my mind. And you see, all the major discoveries always are done by them who know a lot of chemistry or a lot of physics. And similarly, in my area, advanced materials, which is my area of research, chemistry and advanced materials became uh, close to each other some, around 30 years ago. And of course, since then, in my area, superconductivity, high temperature superconductivity, nanoforms of carbon, you know, fullerenes, all kinds of nanotubes, a whole bunch of things happened after that, so post-70s. Now, you see, this is the first time high temperature superconductivity was discovered. Uh, one of the important things was to make a liquid nitrogen superconductor. First time uh, uh, they, uh, it was discovered was at 35 Kelvin. Until now, till 1986, December, the highest superconducting transition was 20, 23 Kelvin. 35 Kelvin was discovered in Switzerland. And everybody wanted to do liquid nitrogen superconductor, which is around above 77 Kelvin. So in that competition, we in Bangalore did this, this is a Bangalore firm, 90K liquid nitrogen superconductor, then in Bangalore, March 1987. This was a very important thing. For those in history of physical science, if they don't know, no other subject has attracted as many pages of literature, the general space as this one. I think thousands and thousands of papers were written on this subject at that time. And then came fullerenes. Discovered in the lab in 1985, made in the lab in 1990. Then came nanotubes of various kinds. 
discovered properly in 1991 and so on. So today the work beyond the molecule, you see chemistry, biology were always in molecules. Today we don't worry about molecule as much but the beyond the molecule, assembly of molecules, various other types of structures of created by molecules. We worry in things like living systems, therapies, optimization in biological systems, that is chemistry and life, that is the combination. This laboratory should be interested in these problems. Therapies, living systems, optimization in biological systems. In chemistry itself, we are interested in new synthesis, but more on self-assembly, complex chemistry. Chemistry of the earth, chemistry of the sea, chemistry of the atmosphere, that is the future. Young people want to know what, is it, what research do you do. Let me tell you, those who do conventional areas of research will not become famous from India or anywhere. Those who are becoming famous even from India, if those few who become very well known, have become because they do the different type of research. You may do wonderful research, publish in the best journal, nobody will read it. Nobody will read in the best journal, best paper, because it's standard material. But by re reading the title, I know what people have done, I don't read the paper anymore. Roughly, you know what they have done. So you have to have a new idea, even if you don't do a good job, it's a completely new idea, new direction. That is the thing about India. Please, young fellows, don't want repeating yourself, do 100 carbon of yourself. You are yourself a carbon of something else. You make a 100 carbon, you will be so pale, nobody will read it. That is the problem of India. Indian, good research in India is very repetitive. Nothing very, very general. That is why very few Indians have become famous. That's why Jane Ramsden was different. She looked for something not done before. So here, I hope Shankar Netraya, Badrinath, you must see that completely new ideas are forming. Not repeat somebody else's. Something, start something different. And that's how you think. You have to think like that from the beginning. You know, if you go on reading everybody's paper, you'll not come with an idea. So don't read too much. No, no, no. If you read every paper, you'll never come with an idea. You'll come with more papers which nobody reads. That is why Indians are not highly cited. How many highly cited Indians are there? Citation above 50. Five? Entire country has not more than four or five. Why? This is the point. So this is meant for young people. Create something original, new, your own idea. Create your own oasis. And these are all in new areas. Now come to what is it one should do for India? What is it one should do for mankind? What is it one should do? I want to give one example. The most burning problem of mankind today is energy. There is no doubt about that. You may work on health problems. Everything is important. But health comes before. Without energy, nothing will be there. You need energy. I hope you know the scale of energy we require. Somebody wrote a, made, a, made a mistake in our Prime Minister's speech one day. I was shocked actually. And he read it out, of course. He read it. He didn't know about the difference. You know, he's not he's an economist. India requires, according to his speech, mistake, you see, uh, brother, uh, 800,000 megawatts of power India requires, you know. It actually meant 300. 3 has become 8. Even 300,000 megawatts of power, how will you get it? Where? Where? Absolutely no way. No, there, no. So, our atomic energy, we will say, yeah, atomic energy, you will give what, 10,000, 10, 20,000. Wind power, another 10,000, 20,000. Solar power, 10,000, 20,000. What do you need is 300,000. Where is that going to be? You are all young people, I am telling you. I am not afraid because I am too old, I won't, before the problem comes, I will be gone. I am mean, approaching 80, you see, next year I am starting my 80th year. As an 80 year old man, I don't worry about future. But you guys and girls here, you will face this world where there will be no energy. So people say, what research should I do? So don't ask me, God damn it, do it, do a research. Research and energy. So what is it? Hydrogen, wonderful. It is a wonderful source of energy. I'll come, I will talk about it for two minutes in a minute, in a short while. Solar, lot of work on solar. Not a good area to get into in India. Too much of international competition. Actually now, People are spreading the solar cells everywhere. India, I went telling the Prime Minister, I think he has just now directed the government that we should plan to 20 to 30,000 megawatts in about 10 years for solar photovoltaics. 
right now it is not even 2000 like i was very very bad you have said yeah good but how will you run your car how will you run your aeroplane so there is no pollution hydrogen hydrogen how will you do it one is artificial photosynthesis i will not be talking about it i must start talking about it in fact i want to read out from you read to you a book by jules verne the famous scientific science fiction author who wrote in 1874 this is what he wrote and what will they burn instead of coal at the craft water replied harding but water decomposed into its primitive elements yes my friends i believe that water will one day be employed as fuel that hydrogen and oxygen which constitute it will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light water will be the coal of the future in 1874 he wrote it absolutely right you take water get hydrogen there are many ways of doing it well you can do water splitting artificial photosynthesis i hope you all know what photosynthesis is one minute please one minute i'll tell what photosynthesis is photosynthesis i'm a teacher don't forget i have to and if you don't know it go away photosynthesis is what photo what what photo there photosystem two photosystem two one in one of the photosystems, what does the plant do? It takes water, decomposes water into hydrogen and oxygen. That hydrogen is used to make food. NADH and all, you know. Oxygen is given out, so you and I are breathing. Oxygen is given out to breathe, hydrogen to make food. Suppose I don't use hydrogen to make food, I can use it for energy. If I can do photosynthesis in the lab, artificial photosynthesis. So it's a very wonderful way of splitting water, get hydrogen, and that is a very important way. In fact, it's one of my major programs going on in my lab now. Uh, one or two others in India, I'm told, are starting. But all over the world, this area of research is getting the biggest support. For those who may not know, I want uh, Badrinath and you to know, the biggest research grant ever given in mankind, in the history of mankind, 120 million dollar one grant was given by President Obama six months ago for hydrogen. One grant. 120 million dollars. Two of my friends have got it that I know who they are. So one of them is by semiconductor nanostructure. With another, I'm not going to talk about it. Another thermal water. What am I interested in thermal water? If you heat water high enough, it decomposes. But not too high a temperature. So Actually, I've been telling one of these girls who's working with me to bring down the water decomposition temperature. I can easily do experiment to bring it down below 1,000 degrees. Unfortunately, two weeks ago, I found a PNAS, National Academy of Science, USA. There's a paper by a friend of mine in Caltech who has done that actually. But I want to do, I have many ideas for that. If we can bring down the decomposition of water to reasonable temperature, then, you know, thermal splitting is also not bad. Except that, then I can go from heating to solar energy. Solar thermal splitting of water is not a bad idea. So these are all problems on hydrogen. Now I want to close my lecture by a few personal reflections. Science, you see, is not a profession like that of a carpenter who closes his job at 5 in the evening. It's not the job of a mechanic who leaves home at 5. Science, if you are a scientist, every minute of your life is involved with that science. There is no weekend, seven days a week or working day, there is no holiday. You have to work like that. Science is that. And if you are not like that, then don't do it. Then you can be a carpenter. In fact, there is no night and day for science. Well, if you are really interested in what you are doing, how can you stop doing at a particular fixed time of 4.30? Tell me. But unfortunately, very few people are interested in that type of science. They do something mechanically. They don't have the passion. I want to see that passion in my country. From you guys in young, young fellows here. When I see, go to China every time. These Chinese boys and girls, my God, they want to do something for China. They want China to be number one. I feel ashamed. Why can't my countrymen do the same? Why can't we say, we in India will be number one? That depends on you guys and young fellows here. Not me. I will do much. I will beat all of you young guys. Give me, give you a tough competition. You compete with me in science. 
That is the way it should be. Young people compete with old guys, so old people give up after that. But there are no young people to compete. That is what I am finding. So I am continuing. Young people should take up the responsibility of doing India service by that dedication. So when there is no yesterday, no tomorrow, no night, no morning, every time, in your mind, if you are a real scientist, you will always be doing science, thinking about science. And also, I will never forget, great scientists that have done science, you must always remember them. We are riding over the shoulders of great men, don't forget. And I always remember, we should, we, we are what we are because we are, the great science was done by others, you should never forget it. I am giving you one story of Faraday, the great man, in 1867 he died. He is the first one who gave the idea of a field, so called particle physics, you know, all this Higgs boson and all that you heard about. That particle physics area, the first idea of a field was Faraday. Except that he could not put it in mathematical terms. And then Maxwell put it in mathematical terms. You must see Maxwell's book where he talks of Faraday, the great teacher, how he owes everything to Faraday. The idea of the field, the idea of a particle theory that came out, the idea of unification of forces that Faraday had already thought of. He was the one who had already said magnetism and electricity, the unification of all these kinds of different, the so-called lines of force that he talked about Faraday. And then Einstein, you see, he actually did the first unification. And Einstein, office, who, who do you, what do you think you had? he had? He had three photographs of Einstein's office. One was Newton, second was Faraday, third was Maxwell. That is why I put these three. Einstein had these three photos, two photos in his room. And that is how science is. So if you want to be a good scientist, don't follow a problem, some stupid problem by eating, cooling, and do something. Somebody else can do all that. If I think of an idea, remember how the idea comes from, where it comes from, how can you do much better than that? Don't think about how to do the same thing somebody else did in your own way, uh, in, the, in the same way. Something different. So I think we, here it's important to know the continuity of science, history of science, at the same time, have your own original map. map. Continuity, originality. How to put it together? That is the challenge, you see. And then, you know, science does many things. If you want to be immortal, if you have all the money in the world, you will not become immortal. There is a famous story in Upanishad. You know that Yagnivalka, his wife, Maitreyi, asked him, My dear husband, if I become the richest woman on earth, will I become immortal? He said, No. With all the money in the world, immortality will never be reached through money. He said, The famous story in Upanishad. Money won't give you. That is why our young people in India are going for money so much. None of them will be immortal. But there is a chance. You may become immortal through science. Immortality of its own kind. So please remember. Well, I will not show that. And say a few words about science. Science we do because according to me, it is the most selfless way of living. Being a good teacher is a selfless way of living. In fact, there is no better profession than science to be selfless. In fact, I want to have written down a few poems from Rabindranath Tagore. Because I hope you all know, next year we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of his Nobel Prize. The first Nobel Prize of India, 100 years ago, Rabindranath Tagore got it. Of course, the second one came in 1930 for C.V. Raman. And after two, we have not had any Nobel Prize. India has had already two Nobel Prizes, Tagore and Raman. And Tagore, Nobel Prize, we are centenary next year. And so I thought I would say something from his uh, Gitanjali about selfishness. He says, I came out alone on my way to my tryst, but who is this that follows me in the silent dark? I move aside to avoid his presence, but I escape him not. He makes the dust rise from the earth with his swagger. He adds his loud voice to every word that I utter. He is my own little self, my lord. He knows no shame, but I am ashamed to come to thy door in his company. He is talking about selfishness. How can I get rid of selfishness? Well, this is one way. 
unless we get rid of selfishness, I'm afraid science won't thrive. In India probably, maybe, the problem is that we can't be selfless completely, but even then, science is one way of doing many of these things according to me. Well, science to me is a way of life, is a wonderful way of living. Particularly, we scientists can give everything we have to young people. That's why it's very important to work with young people. I'm glad you have one young fellow here, my student here, who works PhD with me. In my life, whoever works with me, as long as he's with me, my principle is to give everything I have to him. Everything. No holds bar in terms of science. I can't give my money because I don't have that much. But everything I have in knowledge, everything through science. So, it's very important for senior scientists to give everything to the young people. And young people, therefore, should have the due respect for the young senior in the same way for the, what they give. And this selflessness is, therefore, very, very important to me. It is a way of life, way of uh, philosophy of life. Let me close by saying, time has come. We have to give everything we can to this country. We, if somebody in IIT, I give a talk in some ICER or IIT, they ask me, what is one line message to the young people of today? Each one of you become famous in what you are doing, that's all. You are a carpenter, best carpenter. Electrician, best electrician. You are doing laundry, best laundry. You are a teacher, best teacher. You are a scientist, the best scientist. So if every scientist does his best to become the best in his profession, you may not succeed, but try. Then you see, India will become great. India's greatness, our greatness, our community's greatness, our institution's greatness, like Shankar Maitreya, depends on individual strength to become great. If individuals become great, institutions become great, country become great. We should remember that. China seems to have recognized that. That's why they are encouraging these large numbers, thousands of Chinese to come up. Let me wish all my colleagues, young colleagues here, a great future.